Imagine a country where progress is in terms of gross national happiness. <laughs> it is the tiny Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan where I come from. We are just a small dot on the world map. Isolated, hidden, and protected by the mighty Himalayas. <clears throat> we never saw the first world war. We never saw the second world war. And we thought the whole world was fought on ice. <laughs> <laughs> when the mighty Titanic hit an iceberg, we didn't know. When the beautiful Mona Lisa was stolen and recovered, we didn't know. And we didn't know that the little Mickey Mouse is now 84 years old. <laughs> we dodged the... We are actually basically a bridge between the 19th century and the 21st century. We, we dodged the 20th century, of industrial revolution of 20th century, and connected straight to the information revolution of the 21st century to come to TED to share the happy and the human story of how gross national happiness began. I want to tell the story of gross national happiness from a perspective of an average goodness. I don't have childhood photos. I do not know my true birthday. My mother doesn't remember it. I was born in the jungle of the Himalayas when she was herding the cattle. I too herded the cattle throughout my school days. Of course, today I am a happy cattle herder one dead. Gross national happiness, or GNH, began as a human story. It is a story of a boy who happens to be the world's youngest head of state in 1972, His Majesty Jigme Singhi Ongchu, the fourth king of Bhutan. His father passed away due to a sudden illness, and he found himself inheriting the management of the country at a very young age. He was only 17, a teenager. How would a teenager run their country? If you are a teenager, 17-year-old teenager yourself, what would you do? But the young king actually did something cool. <laughs> He went to the villages and asked the people, what makes you happy? People now fondly recollect that the king's footprints were everywhere, in every villages. In retrospect, he was a young leader, sparking a social change by looking in public policy making, by looking at the world through the eyes of the people, through the human lens, and not through the government structures. What was the young king's motivation? When he became the king, he was in a dilemma. What development path should I follow? What development path should Bhutan follow? On the one hand, he found that he had no resources, capital or human. No amount of planning would ever enable him to catch up with the rest of the world. On the other hand, his village visits and listening to his own people taught him that a person's pursuit of happiness is not only dependent on material things alone in life, but has a great deal to do with harmony of human relationships at home, in the community, harmony with nature, and of course, harmony with one's own self. This experience taught him to declare that gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. Sit down, relax, enjoy your food and your family. Time is not just money, time is also happiness. In other words, economic development is necessary but not sufficient for people's well-being. The country, he thought the country should not only focus on fast economic development if it means destroying its natural environment and disintegrating social fabrics. GNH to him was simply development with human face. For example, 
mountain climbing was and is still banned in Bhutan simply because women from mountain villages of Laya and Lunana told the king that mountains are sacred and must be protected as priceless. The king listened to their voices and banned the mountain climbing and made it into a law. How cool is that? <laughs> of course, today, because of GNS policy, Bhutan has the highest unclimbed mountain in the world. <laughs> A gift to the earth and gift to the future generation of humanity. The children of tomorrow all over the world will be thankful to some humble mountain women who use the power of mother's instinct to save the tallest untouched natural gift on earth for them. So it's not just a Bhutan story, it is a story of humanity as well. Likewise, health and education, he made both free because they are important for people's happiness. He couldn't afford the big ones, so small schools, small health clinics were spread all over the villages, across the country. Mortality went down, life experience went up, illiteracy went down, school enrollment went up. And in fact, I must say, I am myself a, one of the benefits of such GNS policy decision because I was a village boy herding the cattle, and now I am in Harvard. Similarly, my friend here in the dead audience, uh, Cheong Doji from Bhutan, he was a village boy fetching the water in the village, and today he's studying at Yale. Without such powerful GNS policy decisions, we wouldn't be here. We would be herding with cattle or uh, fetching the water. So this is not just this story or my story. This is the largest story of every Buddhist studying in Bhutan, India, Thailand, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Europe, UK, United States, Canada, and other parts of the world. We all come from all these small, tiny villages. But because of such policy, we made it through. Likewise, all people in Bhutan get to choose whether you want to die in a hospital or at home. Homes are usually small, two-story houses, no skyscrapers. <laughs> the king's GNS policy idea is actually to keep things small, simple, and manageable, to enable more uh, human connections and personal interactions. So this is uh, the essence of GNS uh, philosophy. In 2006, the king, Paul King, voluntarily retired and abdicated at a rather early age of 50. Now, of course, he has all the time in the world to take pictures, go cycling, he loves basketball, so he has all the time for that. He's Oxford and Harvard educated son, but still with a humanitarian heart, became the new head of state, His Majesty Jigme Kisa Namge Wancho to take the GNS vision forward. Simply known as Chikmi among his classmates and friends abroad. And as K5 among Buddhist youth, that is King 5 or the fifth king of Bhutan. The new king also began his reign by visiting the remote villages on foot in the tradition of his father's happiness journey. He walks through the villages, sits down with the people and listens to their problems, their hopes, their dreams, and of course their happiness. Uh, Buddhist people call him the people's king. I remember him telling once that he cannot think straight in the capital. In fact, like today, right now, as we speak, uh, the king and my teammates in Bhutan, they are somewhere in Central Bhutan visiting the rural uh, villages on a regular. 70% of the time, the king actually spends his time in the villages because he says, I cannot think straight in the uh, capital. Uh, I, my, I'm happiest when I'm in the villages because when I make the policies that affects their life, I, can, I shall remember their face and can see their face, and that makes me uh, better policies. So uh, hundreds of vulnerable individuals are uh, personally cared, uh, landless, Small landholders are granted uh, free land. Uh, needy students were given their cash transfer scholarships. All these public policies that affect people's lives are made in the small villages and not in the ivory tower. 
Uh, those who do well, the students, they are sent abroad on King's full scholarship after completing the high school in Bhutan. He has taken one extra step that I know of personally uh, to go on a soul searching journey to know every citizen individually by name and by face. Uh, I know this personally because following the footsteps of the king, I also work along with my other colleagues and teammates, several hundred remote villages for three years, taking the king's unique welfare program called Kitu, that's pouring, serving the poorest of the poor at their doorsteps. Uh, it, changed, it has profound impact on me as a human being. Uh, it taught me how to appreciate the public policies that truly serve the public. In 2008, the king completed the gradual democratic reform that his father started and fully voluntarily transferred the power of governance to the people. No revolution, no bloodshed, in peaceful transition with a mutual trust between the king and the people. Bhutan became the world's youngest democracy in 2008 with elected prime minister as head of government while the king still looks after the sovereignty of the country and welfare of the poor as the head of state. In 2008, when he was formally crowned, I was there. The first thing he did was he protested to the people in his coroner's speech, I will never rule as a king, period. But he also promised to the people, if you want me to serve, I will protect you as a parent, care for you as a brother, and serve you as a son. He wants to deconstruct all the complex public policy at the very basic fundamental human level. For example, the needy students who get the education support are called Gebe Toze. It literally means those who share the food with the king. So this is to show that not to uplift the human dignity, not just they are materially helped, but emotionally they are treated equal with the king. Be uh, so that uh, uh, in his own words he said this is to provide kindness, justice and equality to the disadvantaged and vulnerable students of our country. And this is my, here's my favorite, a gay man who saw the king. As a human being, dying happy is also important. We discovered that Abkhazan 86 is the poorest man in Bhutan. He lived in a cave near a village. So we affectionately call him a gay man who saw the king because king personally visited him on foot. Uh, immediately after visiting, uh, king sent the personal gifts and food items to, to the cave with an instruction that in Bhutan, not a single person should go hungry, even for one day. The Cameron shared his dream. They also shared his dream. When he dies, he wants the king to take care of his funeral. Last year, on 14 February, I received a Valentine message from my uh, teammate, Rashitoke, on my Facebook that says, Nima, I have sad news. Our gay men passed away this morning on the Valentine's Day. We were sad, but we were inspired because he died happy, knowing that the king will take care of his funeral. The king kept the promise and did take care of his funeral. A state funeral, in fact, hosted by the district administration and the monastery body at the instruction of the king. The poorest man in the country got a state funeral. So happiness is our future. GNH is now perpetuated and sustained by institutionalizing into four policy pillars of sustainable economic development, natural conservation, cultural preservation, and good governance. And we even renamed the Government Central Planning Agency as the Gross National Happiness Commission. The king has said GNH is development with values, strongly believing in the power of upholding human values to promote happiness both in Bhutan and in the world. Where will happiness go? When I think of it, this is not the story of head of state. This is a story that's relevant to all of us. This is a story of putting happiness and human dignity first in whatever we do in our life, 
and uh, how powerful they can be for building a nation, a company, an organization, a family, and a future.